Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well. So, let us continue reading the fatwas of Imam Albani regarding fiqh, creed, and transactions. I've been doing more reading off the channel because the baby is in her exploration phase. So, that's been cute. She'll just crawl on me while I read and whatever. But now she's out with a jog with her father and sister. So, we got time to squeeze in some bucks. Okay. The question here is, are the Quranic verses that discuss Allah's attributes mutashabiha, i.e. having more than one meaning and not entirely clear, or munkham? Okay. Answer. These verses are considered as mutashabiha regarding the state of being of these attributes that suits Allah's, the Almighty and Majesty, but as for their meaning, they are of the entirely clear verses, Munkham, which constitute clear meanings known in Arabic and for its speakers. Okay, so two terms here for us. Mutashabiha, which means has one meaning, it's so entirely clear. And then it looks like that Munkam is entirely clear. Okay. Since we affirm the existence of Allah's self and never deny it, for denying it means disbelief, we also affirm the attributes and never deny them. Okay, here we go. So, Affirming the existence of Allah's self. So here's a term. Allah's self. And we don't deny it. So don't deny Allah's self. For denying it means disbelief. So kufur, right? If you deny Allah's self, you have committed an act of disbelief, according to Albani, right? We also affirm the attributes and never deny them, since we also do not know Allah's self, i.e. his state of being. So, Allah's self, state of being. State of being. We could never attribute any state of being for his attributes. Interesting. Some of the well-versed scholars of hadith, such as Abu Bakr al-Khatib, said, describing the attributes originates from describing the self, whether positively or negatively. As Salah number 3, Q2, page 59, 1413, Hijra. Never heard of that. Uh, Abu Bakr al-Khatib. I had to check out his books. Let's put some brackets around that. Okay, so that was that. The way this book is formatted is question, answer, question, answer. So now we're on a new question, okay? Question. How should one reconcile between what is mentioned in Ibn Umar's radiallahu anhu narration, that is, with his Allah's left hand, and with what was mentioned in Muslim's narration, the Prophet wasallam, said, both his Allah's hands are right. What's really useful here is in those parentheses, they put the Roman text for Radiallahu Anhu and then in parentheses, italicized so that we can learn to memorize that. It's very useful. Answer. Okay. First of all, there is no contradiction between the two hadiths. The Prophet's words, Allahu alayhi wa sallam, both his hands are right, affirm the meaning of Allah's verse. There is nothing like unto him, and he is the all-hear, the all-seer, Ashura. Hey, that's interesting, because in our brains, you might think, how can something have two right hands? That would be a deformity, right? But then, if we remember the Ashura uh, over here, right, that there's nothing like unto him. So, 
when we try to think of an octopus or something like that, we just don't get it. We can't say like something ridiculous. Oh, well, the, look how the Hindus draw their idols and their gods with these multiple arms. We don't do that. You see what I'm saying? Like we don't try to push it into a artistic depiction, right? So this is very unique. I like that. That's a good answer. When I hear two hands are right, it means that the le not possessing a symbolic left hand means there's no evilness, no, no corruption. Only purely what's good. Only the right. Can only gi only give some of the right hand, never from the left hand. Because remember, we have a lot of... I hope I'm verbalizing that well. Because when you get your hand with your, re your record in your right hand... On Judgment Day, that's good. You get in your left hand, you're going to hell. We have phrases like, what the right hand possesses. We have, you know, eat with your right, wipe your bum with your left. So there's a lot of the right hand being good, the left hand having a different function. So it's sleeping on your right side more often than your left. Uh, starting would do from the right, like... Others have said, like, you begin with washing, like, with your, like, right hand or, like, stuff like that. You see what I'm saying? You, you, there's a lot of that in the faith if you actually, like, go through and pay attention. So when I hear two right hands, I don't think literally or just symbolically, but I do think of the, the metaphor. But it could be literal. I don't know. Right? When it's, I don't know. So that's the best thing I say. Whatever befits Allah's majesty concerning that, I can't compare it. So I just try my best, right? But I don't anthropomorphize into like a Krishna type of imagery. You see what I'm saying? That's what my point is. The Prophet wasallam description celebrates Allah's glorification. For Allah's the almighty hand is unlike that of a human being. One left and one right, but both his hands are right. He is glorified. Okay, so this is interesting too. So maybe left and right, but one isn't deviant, one isn't uh, good. Or like you see, it's like an equal, like both are good. Allah can only give good. Like Allah is the most just. Never going to shorthand you. Second, Ibn Umar's narration is an odd one. As I explained in Takrij al Mutashah biha al Arba ah al Warda fil Quran number one by al Maududi. Okay, so let's put that in brackets. Want to make sure we can learn later on these books, right? Abu Dawood narrated the hadith with other wordings that run as follows: with his other hand instead of with his left hand. Oh, look at that. And the former meaning goes in accordance with the Prophet's hadith. Both his hands are right. Allah knows best. Asla number 4, Q1, page 68, 14, 13, Hijra. Fascinating. Look at that. Okay, so that's one reason why I like reading the hadith in the order is because you also learn the different wordings and you begin to memorize them and identify them. So here when we hear that there's two different wordings with his other hand and, and with his left hand, we can see like, okay, okay, let's see. Okay, next question. It's a really good book. Not too uh, thick, but boom, it's got like, knowledge. I like that. Questions. You have been living in this country for so many years. And your call to Allah's book and his prophet Sunnah, the Salafi Dawah, has proven fruitful. So what do you advise your students in this country, and the seekers of knowledge in other Islamic countries? Okay, so... Salafi Dawa. Okay, so this means, according to this questioner, that Albani did Salafi Dawa. Okay. The path of the Salaf, Ahosuna wal Jama'a, we're learning terms here. I give my Muslim brethren around the world two pieces of advice. Seek beneficial knowledge, and practice righteous deeds. Okay. The beneficial true knowledge constitutes the words of Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
the Sunnah as Ibn al Qayyim al Jawziyah Rahimahullah said. Okay, we have another person here. Uh, Ibn al Qayyim al Jawziyah. There looks like a poem here. Let's see. Knowledge resides in Allah's, His Messengers, and His Companions' words, never in misleading words. Never does knowledge excite disputes between the prophet's words and jurist's opinions. Nay, never is it in denying divine attributes to escape assimilation or negation. Ooh. <laughs> I like that. But as you notice here, Ibn al-Qayyim added to the main sources of knowledge the words of the Sahaba, and this was for a particular reason. The value of which many followers of the Sunnah, not to mention other peoples, are unaware. This is truly our Dawah. So there are three main sources of knowledge. Here we go. The Noble Quran, the Sunnah, and the Righteous Predecessor's Way, especially the Sahaba. Okay, boom. What do we got right here? So, practice, practice, righteous, deeds. Okay, seek, beneficial, knowledge. Very important to annotate, don't forget. Then we had the Noble Quran, the Sunnah, which is the Hadith and the Sirah, from my understanding. And then the Righteous Predecessors Way, especially the Sahaba. And the way I've been going about that is you read their biographies of what we can find. Yeah. There is uh, Islamic House Publishing, I think is what it's called. They got a bunch of uh, a series of Ali bin Abi Talib, Umar, Ibn al Qatab, Abu Bakr al Siddiq, all of them. Uthman bin Affan. Did I already say that? But where was the third source mentioned in Ibn Kaymin's work? Who is one of the eminent imams in the da'wah taken from? It originates from Allah's, the mighty words. Okay. Alright. Yes. Now we have a Quran I had here for us. Quote, And whosoever contradicts and opposes the messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him, after the right path has been shown clearly to him, and follows other than the believer's way, we shall keep him in the path he has chosen. And burn him in hell. What an evil destination. And Nisa 4, 115. This issue has been discussed thoroughly in many published books and recorded cassettes. So I advise my Muslim brothers in all countries of the world to seek beneficial knowledge. The knowledge of the book of Quran and Sunnah in the way the righteous predecessors sought it. Then to act righteously i.e. in accordance with this knowledge. For the great scholars say... A scholar who acts not upon his knowledge is like the worshipper who worships Allah ignorantly. Okay, so finding the knowledge, implementing the best of your ability, knowing it and trying, because gaining knowledge is a lifelong pursuit, right? Allah the Almighty says, so whoever hopes for the meeting with his Lord, let him work righteousness and associate none as partner in worship of his Lord. Al-Kaf 18, 110. So here, uh, not associate none, so don't commit shirk. So Tawheed again. Shirk. And then uh, work righteousness, so your deeds. So when people try to say women are less, men are more, I think it's very important to say, well, a woman can, and man are going to show up on Judgment Day with their deeds. And we should compete with each other in doing good deeds. And some women will have more than other men, and some men will have more than women. And that is what we look at. Not just jobs in the society or functions inside and outside the home, but how many acts of good deeds can you do. Very important. It is clear to us now that the beneficial knowledge resides in the Quran and Sunnah and sought in the manner of the righteous predecessors, Salaf. But what is the righteous deed? The righteous deed has two conditions. Okay, look, this is great. Okay. First, it should be done sincerely for Allah's sake, not for the people's appreciation or rewards. That one's a 
tough one. Really tough because everyone wants to be appreciated and get a little bit of recognition for their efforts. But it's not the, you know, you gotta watch out. You know, like if you're doing something, you, you want to keep doing it no matter the views, no matter if you never get the recognition, you have to keep pressing onward, knowing your intention and perfecting every day, right? It's like a, it's hard to do. There's a lot of temptations for people, right? It's like a doctor. Are they doing it to heal people or are they doing it to get, you know, uh, their promotion, right? Or they're just doing it for the money, right? Second, the righteous deed should be in accordance with the Prophet ﷺ's sunnah. Otherwise, it will never be accepted. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the Alameen, the world. Asla number 22, page 75, 1420, Hijrah. Okay, so what do we see here? The sunnah. So we have to see that this, does this action, uh, is it in the sunnah? So it talks, you're going to do a lot of studying, essentially. There's a lot to do. You know, you try your best, you hope for the best, and Allah will judge us on our intentions. And, you know, reading and learning theology and whatnot, all that stuff can seem futile to so many when there's so much temptation to do other things. Time goes by fast. Uh, but you also don't want to get burnt out because then you can't taste the sweetness of it, I'd argue. Right? It's a very fascinating subject to think about. So, great. Great, great, great. So, a righteous deed is done sincerely for Allah's sake. And it has to be in accordance with the uh, Sunnah. So, in the Quran and Sunnah, we got to make sure that uh, you are making sure it doesn't exceed the boundaries here. And to remember to practice righteous deeds, seek beneficial knowledge. Beneficial knowledge is going to be for us in studying the Sahaba, the Sunnah, the Noble Quran. Okay. Great. MashaAllah. And then remember we learn about Allah's self. You don't deny Allah's self. If you do, it's kufr. And Allah's self is a state of being. Then that word, mutashahabiyah. Uh, Having more than one meaning, not entirely clear, and then Munkam is uh, uh, entirely clear verses. Awesome. Okay, great, great outlining in this book. I like when it's just organized like that. Question, answer, boom. Okay, if you like to join my blog, it's www.subscribestar.com/slash Mahonite Guide. Hope to see you there.